Chapter 13. What after salvation? Pat Jones had spent the night in the caravan parked at the side of Ken Knight's home, together with Paddy, who had nowhere else to live. We spent the next day together, and I told them both of my experience. I assumed and expected them to fully understand and see what had happened to me. Instinctively, things were different to me. An internal change had come about, and by it, I had new desires. I no longer wished to live as I'd lived in the past. I wished to be rid of my bad ways. No one told me I had to give up any particular way of life. I found within me an internal desire to choose the good and refuse the evil. Upon reflection, I say this was the evidence of the new birth. And I later found this experience spoken of by the Lord Jesus Christ himself in John's Gospel, chapter 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Truly, truly, I say unto thee, and except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The Apostle Paul writes also the same in Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ Jesus, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I knew also there was a part of me which was just the same. When I would do good, evil was present with me. The Apostle Paul in Romans also expressed this, Romans 7 verse 21. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Whilst this was my experience, I found it impossible to convey this to my friends, even though I tried ever so hard. I had in my possession much stolen property. In fact, hundreds of pounds worth of stolen goods. I was no longer prepared to live off the benefits of stolen goods. What should I do? I had involved others in my crime of stealing, and these could not help me now. In fact, Mick West came to see me the next day, and when he heard me explaining Jesus had spoken to me, he began to fear I might go to the police and confess my crimes. I did not actually say to him I wanted him to return the colour TV set, which I had stolen and swapped for his Citroen car, but he was concerned, as he did not know what to think. Poor Mick. He must have panicked, thinking I was about to go to the police. As he was concerned, some of the stolen goods that I had left in his garage were stolen, including the mini-engine, the mini-sub chassis. I don't remember what happened to these parts, but I asked Mick to dispose of them. I was later informed that they'd been dumped in the reservoir. That Saturday evening, both Pat Jones and I decided to go to the social club at Park Street. This was a usual thing for us to do on a Saturday night. I had determined to go and see my mates and explain what had happened to me. We walked down there, but did not go in. After seeing one or two people, I broke my news to them. I can't remember what I said. I'd no desire to stay there and went back to the night's home. My inclination to live it up as normal was no longer with me. I now seemed at a loose end, not knowing what to do next. From that time forward, Pat Jones began to realise things had really changed for me. The next day being Sunday, Mrs Knight took both Pat Jones and I to the local Baptist church at Southcourt in the evening. I distinctly remember the passage of scripture the preacher was speaking from. It was in Exodus, where the whole nation of Israel was about to enter the promised land. However, they listened to the evil reports of the ten spies and did not take heed to the voice of the two good spies who had given encouragements to go in and possess the land. I remember also I saw, whether he preached this or not, that this was a picture of the body of Christ, the church of today. After that meeting... Mrs. Knight introduced me to Martin White, who gave me a copy of the New Testament called The Good News for Modern Man. I began to read this straight away. This I received gratefully and began to read it every day, as it was in simple English. The following days were spent in the afterglow and certainty of this new life that had opened up to me. I thirsted for knowledge, the knowledge of God in Jesus Christ. I told the folk at work about my experience and could not remain silent about the things I was learning. My evenings were spent from then on at Mrs Knight's home discussing the scripture with some of her Christian friends. Both Pat Jones and Paddy all seemed interested to hear. 
I'm now amazed at my own ignorance then, for until then I'd never read the Bible for myself, I could hardly read. I did not know what the Acts of the Apostles meant. Within two weeks, I had read the New Testament in this small Bible, the Good News for Modern Man, and thought I understood it. I soon learned from the scripture that in the economy of salvation, it was the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed on the cross at Calvary that was the means of me obtaining a free pardon from all my sins, but also that I was given freely a righteousness to justify me before God. In this respect, the Lord Jesus was a true substitute, and he died for me without cost at all to me. These were the things which I learned, as it were, and drank like water from the well of salvation. I learned them by reading the scripture. I didn't know them from the night Jesus spoke to me. I attended college that week, but there was a difference. I had decided I would not dress as usual in my clothes to show off which would have been Levi jeans, white boots with red toe caps or whatever colour I chose to spray my car that week, a Ben Sherman shirt, a loose leather jerkin. I felt I must not only be more sober, but dress more soberly too, i.e. not show off as I used to do. So I dressed my best trousers, which were from my Prince of Wales check suit. Shirt, normal pullover and normal shoes. Of course, I had to tell all my friends about my experience. I protested to them, look, I even dress differently. They couldn't believe me. I told one of my lecturers, Mr. Jones, in front of them all, but I was just given a smile of wonder. The same week, I felt constrained to go and tell my friend Rupert, a West Indian from Jamaica. He lived in the room at 14 Bister Road, Aylesbury, so Pat Jones and I went down to see him. As soon as I met him and told him what had happened in front of his new girlfriend, Rupert said, his reply was, I told you, Dave, not to take that LSD. Again, they were numplus. They couldn't believe it, even though I tried my best to convince them. Being in the world, but not of it, I did not wish to continue the way of life that I'd lived in the past. My back was now turned from the world I built for myself. I was self-seeking, one's own glory, asserting self without considering others, stealing, Thoughts of adultery, fornication, drug-taking, boasting, drunkenness, violence, worldly ambition. I say worldly ambition because I believe we all have worldly ambitions. But when we are converted and come to Christ, we are called to forsake it. This is forsake the world and its ambitions. We all have our own worlds to forsake when we become a Christian. Some have a religious world to turn from as a person may have been born in a religious family or have a circle of religious friends, but in their world they have their own natural fallen nature to contend with. Fallen humanity, fallen human nature seeks to gratify its desires and as such sin the whole day long. A religious person still has all the workings of the natural man, as those have that have no religion. Any thought or act which is born out of selfishness, greed, pride, Avarice, evil thinking of others, backbiting, slander and prejudice may all be practiced by those in a religious or non-religious world. So to forsake the world means to forsake all those things and actions which are natural to us and are contrary to the way of Christ. The religious and non-religious persons need to turn from their world. Some persons have no religion or religious friends, yet they too have natural desires, a fallen human nature which they seek to please ambitions of fame for its own sake, the love of money, selfishness, the practice of gossip, evil speaking of others, are all to be turned from. It doesn't matter whether you be religious or non-religious, we are to forsake the world from which we've come. When we seek to follow Christ, we are called to be in the world, but not of it. This is really what John Bunyan sought to express when he told his story of the man who turned his back on the city of destruction. One of the problems, however, was then that his story only describes the picture of those who were non-religious and the pattern of their lifestyle. In reality, a religious person, one who is not born again, has a pattern and lifestyle which is equally wrong and such need to turn from. It's easy for such a person to think because they don't do certain things that they see in non-religious world do to look down and judge them, thinking they're better than them. Not so. We all have a world to turn from. When a person is born again, they have an ordinary life natural to them 
and are part of the natural world, but we all must turn from our world in order to follow Christ. I now had an inward and real desire not to continue in those ways, which I just mentioned, for they just perpetuate my former sinful self, of which I had had enough. A change of heart had taken place. This was a fight. That is not to say I couldn't be tempted to find pleasure in sins. There was a part of me that was still the same, but I had a desire to put to death sinful thoughts, actions. Should I allow wrong affections to move me, I was self-condemned with an accompanying self-abhorrence and I knew what was pleasing to God. By the grace of God, I was able to resist and fight against sins.